The case of Sheila Labar, a monster with an angelic appearance. Psychological and physical traumas received at an early age can have a very unpredictable effect on adult life. Of course, far from always, they lead to the fact that a person becomes cruel and seeks to hurt others. But sometimes it is the trauma can give rise to a real monster. Criminal psychologist Adrian Rain believes that there are genetic and psychophysical mechanisms that can turn a person into a cold-blooded killer, about which he wrote in detail in his book, Anatomy of Violence. History knows a lot of serial criminals who had a truly hellish childhood, and perhaps to them can be attributed our heroine today, Sheila Labar. This woman had an angelic appearance, which she skillfully used, seducing her victims, and then brutally murdered them. Despite the fact that the court was able to prove only two of her crimes, criminologists are sure that there were many more. And now let's look at this difficult story from the beginning and try to understand whether Sheila Labar was a born monster or became him as a result of the cruelty that she faced in childhood. Who is Sheila Labar? Sheila Labar was born in 1958, the 4th of July, in the small country town of Fort Payne, Alabama. She was the youngest of three children of her parents and was raised with her brother and sister, Lynn. Her childhood was spent in a picturesque but rather secluded place, on a farm nestled among cornfields. According to the memories of Lynn's older sibling, Sheila was an active, inquisitive, and open-minded girl with a creative streak. She liked to be in the center of attention, had a good voice and cute appearance, so perhaps, if her life had turned out differently, she would have become a famous actress or singer. But instead of bright posters, her name decorated the pages of Criminal Chronicles. The unimaginable cruelty of her father, the head of the family, Manuel Bailey for many years suffered from alcohol addiction, although it would be more accurate to say that his addiction suffered from his entire family. He often went on binges, turning into a real beast who enjoyed abusing his wife and children. He insulted and humiliated them, beat them with anything that came to hand, could throw everyone out in the middle of the night in a downpour or frost, and locked himself in the house, not letting anyone inside. Mothers, daughters, and sons often had to spend the night in a barn or in the open air in the field. One day, when Manuel was once again in a drunken rage, he began throwing dishes and other objects at his family members. The mother tried to cover the children as best she could, but one of the flower pots thrown by her husband hit her youngest daughter, Sheila, in the head. Sheila suffered a serious concussion and a lifelong scar on her temple, which she painstakingly covered with her hair but not even the insults and beatings were the worst thing that the sisters had to endure in their parents' home. According to the memories of Sheila and Lynn, Manuel from an early age forcibly inclined them to intimacy. The mother may have been aware of what was going on, but the subject was never broached. However, despite the nightmare at home, Sheila did well enough in school. She dreamed of leaving the farm as soon as possible and go to conquer the big city. The girl was quite ambitious and determined, she passionately wanted to realize her childhood dream in life and become an actress or pop singer. And she had everything for this. Charisma, bright appearance, and a beautiful voice. Adulthood, first marriage. Barely Sheila was 18 years old. She left her parents' home, but adult life was not so joyful. To enter the university, she was not allowed to average score, and to move to the big city, she simply did not have the money. Then Sheila got a job as a maid in one of the hotels, where by that time her older sister was already working. It should be noted that Sheila had a slender figure and a very attractive appearance. She had big blue eyes, a charming smile, and a mop of thick long hair. She was surrounded by attention from men, and over time, she learned to use it and manipulate her suitors. In the late 70s, Labar, then Bailey, met a guy named Jonathan Baxter, and a romantic relationship began between them. Jonathan was not yet 20 years old at the time, but he already had a young daughter from a previous relationship. However, the child did not become a hindrance, and soon the couple got married. However, this marriage lasted only a few months and collapsed after Jonathan learned that the young wife abused his daughter while he disappeared at work. Sheila was frankly annoyed with the child, and she would raise her hand or lock her in a closet if she started crying or acting up. Jonathan did not organize scandals and listen to explanations. He just Strazut filed for divorce 
and put his wife with his belongings outside his house. He never wanted to see or hear from her again. After the divorce, Sheila dated various men and mostly lived off them. But all these relationships were fleeting and lasted from a few weeks to a couple of months until in the early 80s she met her future second husband, Ronnie Jennings. The tumultuous romance soon led to marriage and Sheila took on a double last name, Bailey Jennings. It was an unhealthy relationship between two irascible and unstable people who regularly cheated on each other, scandalized and even fought. Still, their marriage lasted more than three years. In 1984, after another family quarrel, Sheila demanded a divorce from her husband, but he refused her. In fact, Ronnie did not hold on to the relationship at all. He just wanted to piss off his wife and make her mad, and he succeeded. Sheila became hysterical, took a large number of drugs in front of her husband, drinking strong alcohol, and after this infernal cocktail, sat behind the wheel of the car and rushed down the road. Naturally, soon Sheila, under the influence of pills and alcohol, lost consciousness, flew off the road, and at high speed crashed into a tree. She miraculously survived, but suffered a massive head injury. She spent more than a week in a deep coma, and doctors made no prognosis. When Sheila finally regained consciousness and gradually recovered, she was transferred to a psychiatric hospital where she spent several months. She later complained to her sister that one of the orderlies was constantly harassing her and possibly taking advantage of her helpless state when she was heavily sedated. After all this, Sheila returned to her second husband's home, but began to behave not just aggressively, but threateningly toward him. When during another scandal she attacked Ronnie and poked him in the chest with nail scissors, Ronnie, fearing for his own life and health, filed for divorce and hurriedly moved out of the mad woman, rich lover. When the second marriage was dissolved, the young woman began looking for lovers through the dating columns of the print media, and she left her ads there as well. But no man did not stay with her for long, because Sheila tended to dominate everything, rigidly suppressing their partners both in intimate and everyday life. Soon the photo of an attractive girl in the dating section drew the attention of 60-year-old Wilfred Bill Labar. The man had previously been married twice and had adult children and grandchildren from previous marriages. He was widowed a few years ago and had been living alone on his large country ranch ever since. Bill was a fairly wealthy man. He had a chiropractic office in Epping, New Hampshire, and on the ranch he raised horses. At the same time, he was very lonely and needed a strong, powerful woman. In fact, that's exactly what he found. Sheila was attracted by the wealth of her new acquaintance, and she decided that it would be an ideal union for her. And to make Bill completely lost his head, she began to send him a postal mail frank letters, supplementing them with her nude photos. The trap worked, and soon Labar invited a charming pen pal to visit his ranch. Their romance developed rapidly. An elderly man is not stingy on expensive gifts for a young mistress, and in the summer of 1987, she moved to live with him. This is incredibly flattered the doctor, who now went out in public with a beautiful companion, who was half his age and was fit for him as a daughter. Nevertheless, he did not plan to marry Sheila. However, Sheila, not waiting for a marriage proposal, changed her name, calling herself Labar. Bill was surprised by this turn of events, but he did not object. Sheila began to interfere in all the affairs of her elderly lover, starting to control his business, finances, and disposition of his property. In addition, Bill was getting older and could not satisfy the intimate needs of a young woman. Then, according to Sheila herself, he allowed her to meet other men whom she often brought directly to their home. One of Sheila's regular lovers, closer to the mid-90s, was a Jamaican national named Wayne Ennis, he was much younger than Sheila and was initially hired as an au pair on the ranch, but soon the young man, with Bill's consent, which was probably given under pressure from Sheila, moved to live in the owner's house. In 1995, Sheila and Wayne officially legalized their relationship, and the spouse considered that from now on, he would be her only man. But soon he realized that he was wrong because his wife continued to meet with different men. Wayne was not satisfied with this, and one day he jumped with fists on Sheila and her next lover, causing them bodily harm. Accustomed to being dominated, Sheila for the first time didn't know how to deal with her third husband, who got into a fight every time a rival appeared on the horizon, 
Eventually, she filed for divorce and sought a court injunction to stop Wayne from approaching her, accusing him of violence and assault. Another divorce did not affect the turbulent personal life of Sheila, who continued to meet with numerous lovers, changing them like gloves. True, now her relationship increasingly often began to end with lawsuits from men who accused Sheila not just in cruelty, but also in the threat to their lives and health. Thus, one of her boyfriends she deliberately hit by a car and almost ran over. Another almost broke his head, and another scratched his face so that he was forever scarred. Sheila, with age, became more and more dangerous to others. From every man she demanded obedience, and in cases of disobedience, fell into a rage. In 2000, at the age of 74, Bill Labar died of heart failure. Although doctors and police officers did not see a criminal trail in the death of an elderly man, his family members were convinced that Sheila had something to do with it. In their opinion, she had been poisoning Bill little by little for years and literally drove him into the light. Despite the fact that Bill and Sheila were never officially married, Sheila, according to the will, became the sole heiress of all his property. The relatives tried to challenge this through the courts, but never got anywhere. They are still convinced that the mistress forced Bill to write the will she wanted. House of Temptation. After Bill's death, as I have already mentioned, all his property came under Sheila's complete control. Now she no longer had to consider anyone's opinion. She could do whatever she wanted with the estate she had inherited. She herself called her home a place of seduction and pleasure, where there were no inhibitions. She met men on the streets, in bars, on the internet, lured them to her, and then tried to keep them on the ranch as long as possible. She didn't care about their age, skin color, or any physical appearance. She promised them unearthly pleasure, and then sought to suppress and subjugate them to her will. Sheila regularly tried to seduce couriers by meeting them in the nude and offering an alternative method of payment. But she didn't take into account the fact that she herself was not getting any younger and was nowhere near as attractive as she used to be. It got to the point where couriers simply refused to come to her address. Neighbors noticed that on the ranch, Labar, constantly come different men, but some hurried to leave the place the same day. Others were delayed, but also for a short time. What was going on in the house itself could only be guessed at. Where had Michael DeLorge disappeared to? Soon, Sheila decided to look for lovers among men who were in dire need of housing, money, or those men who suffered from addiction. This category was the most vulnerable and proved to be an easy prey for the cunning woman, who everywhere posed as a widowed millionaire and talked about her untold wealth inherited by her. In 2004, Labar met on one of the city streets homeless man named Michael DeLodge. He was in a difficult life situation and lost literally everything because of addiction to illegal drugs. His relatives tried to send him to a rehabilitation clinic, but he ran away from there and has been loitering ever since. Sheila liked Michael, and she invited him to her, promising shelter, food, and the necessary drugs in exchange for intimacy. Moving to the ranch, the guy was completely dependent on his old mistress. He complied with all her demands, afraid to be on the street again. But Sheila quickly got into the taste, and her desires became more and more sophisticated. She bound, beat, and humiliated Michael, taking pleasure in it. He tried to escape several times, walking dozens of miles and hiding in homeless shelters, but he never decided to go to the police for fear they wouldn't believe him. Meanwhile, Sheila found him each time and brought him back to the ranch. In desperation, he tried to contact his family members and let them know he was in trouble. His loved ones immediately responded to this disturbing news, but it was too late. In October 2005, Michael DeLorge disappeared without a trace. When his family contacted Sheila directly, she stated that she and Michael had broken up. He had left her, and his current whereabouts were unknown to her. Michael did not show up at any of the places he had been to before. No one who knew him had seen him, and there was no way to contact him. Contacting the police was fruitless, and Labar remained beyond suspicion, trusting Kenny County. Sheila's tales of her exorbitant wealth were greatly exaggerated, and the house and automobile had to be maintained, so she was forced to get a job. Naturally, Sheila chose an occupation to her liking. She became an operator of intimate phone services. 
since she had a truly enchanting voice, men fell for the bait and offered to meet her in person. Among such guys was Kenny County, who at the time of their acquaintance was barely 24 years old. The young man was attractive in appearance, very good-natured and open. However, he had a low IQ level, due to which he was very gullible. This was exactly the kind of guy Labar was looking for. Kenny was very close to his mother, on whom he actually depended, but Sheila, with the help of clever manipulations, managed to break this connection and literally lure Kenny to herself. She made him an unforgettable night of love and promised that they would be like this all the time. The young man decided that he had met the woman of his dreams, about which he informed his relatives and then moved to live in Sheila's house. But soon Sheila showed the guy her true face, having arranged for him a real torture room in one of the rooms. Each time intimacy inevitably turned into a brutal beating or something worse. Kenny's body was covered with bruises, abrasions, scratches, cuts, and burn marks. But he could not leave the house of the mistress who had completely subjugated his will. Sheila did not allow him to see and communicate with his loved ones, and his family could only guess what was happening to Kenny. The first alarm was raised by neighbors who periodically noticed the guy and were horrified by his sickly appearance. A few days before his disappearance, a local store clerk took a picture of the young man on her cell phone camera, and later this picture was attached to the case file in court. In the photo, Kenny's condition could be described as deplorable. He was very thin, there were huge bruises under his eye and on his cheek, and his nose was probably broken. Judging by the degree of healing, all these injuries had been inflicted at different times, which suggested that the guy had been brutally beaten for a long time. The contents of his cart were also alarming. He rolled two large canisters of fuel to the cash register, as it later turned out, for his own cremation. The store employees were so puzzled and even frightened by the guy's appearance that they decided to report him to the police for possible domestic violence. But this time, Sheila managed to get away with it, and they could not charge her with anything. Soon Kenny stopped contacting his family altogether, and when his worried mother arrived at Labar's house, the owner behaved aggressively and advised to leave Kenny alone. All subsequent attempts ended similarly, at which point Kenny County's family filed a missing persons report with the police, indicating that he may be being held forcibly at the country ranch, a home crematorium and gruesome findings. When police arrived at Sheila's home, she claimed that the young man no longer lived with her and claimed that Kenny had run away because his mother, whom he was allegedly terrified of, began visiting them frequently. As evidence, Sheila provided an audio recording in which she asks her lover if his own mother had attacked him, and he quietly gives an affirmative answer. It all seemed more than strange, and the very next day, an officer visiting Sheila secured a search warrant for the estate. Sheila had been on the police's radar many times before, and her name had been linked to another mysterious disappearance of a boyfriend. But over the years, Sheila had never been questioned, and her house and grounds had never been searched. When the police arrived, they did not find Labar at home, but they did see several fires burning near the outbuildings. The fires looked strange and were made of improvised materials, a mattress, fragments of wooden furniture, hay, etc., all doused with a flammable mixture. One of the bonfires had bones in it that clearly looked like human remains. The squad requested reinforcements in the form of forensic experts, reporting all the findings, but that turned out to be just the tip of the iceberg compared to what they discovered next. Almost all over the house were found poorly washed traces of blood. It was so much that it seemed as if there had been a real massacre. It turned out that the blood belonged to at least three different people. The bones smoldering in the fire belonged to the missing Kenny, and there were two empty fuel cans lying nearby, the same ones the boy had bought at the local store the day before. But that wasn't all. Also found on the property were the remains of Michael Delage, who had disappeared a few years earlier, and some fingers of some third guy who was never identified. Among other things, a large number of items belonging, judging by the size, to various men were fished out of the sump at the ranch, the fates of which have not been learned. The hostess herself was not at home at the time of the police visit. She had figured it out and gone on the run. Sheila hitchhiked to Boston, where she obviously hoped to get lost. 
Moreover, on the way, she seduced one of the drivers who gave her a ride, and he trustingly invited her to live in his house. However, the next day, having seen on TV news about the search for a dangerous criminal, the new lover himself called the police and reported that Sheila is now in his bed. It was there that she was arrested. During the search of Sheila's home, another frightening find was made, a box of videotapes. On the tapes, Hanny, Michael, and several other men confessed to horrific crimes, but judging by the guy's appearance and condition, they made these confessions under torture. Since Labar's arrest, her mental health has raised a lot of questions, so the court ordered the necessary evaluations. Sheila was found to have a delusional disorder as well as signs of schizophrenia. She called herself an angel sent from heaven to protect children from rapists. It was Sheila's failing mental health that became the basis on which her attorney tried to build a defense. He called his client a profoundly sick person and tried to prove that she was not aware of her actions. The reason for this was the mental and physical trauma she had suffered as a child. The defendant herself claimed that many years ago, when she was in that terrible accident and found herself in a coma, on the verge of death, she met with God, and the latter told her to cleanse the world of men who infringe on children. Sheila's ex-husbands and some of Sheila's lovers also spoke in court who, in one voice, called her a crazy, unstable, and extremely violent woman. And Wayne Annis, the third husband, said that the ex-wife repeatedly persuaded him to kill Mr. Labar in order to seize his property. But despite the defense's attempts to convince the court that Sheila was insane and in need of treatment, it was proven that she was aware of her actions at the time of her crimes. She was found guilty in July 2008 and sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of ever being released. All of her appeals were rejected. Sheila is now serving her sentence in Florida at Homestead Correctional Facility.